Welcome to the Designing Hollywood podcast in association with The John Campia Show. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. Today's episode is sponsored by Paris Costumes International. Today's guest is brilliant Spanish Oscar-nominated costume designer Paco Delgado, who grew up on the Canary Islands, where he cultivated a vivid eye for color, shape, and texture. That aesthetic, developed at the Institute of Theatre of Barcelona, has served him well. In 2011, he collaborated with the famously meticulous director Pedro Almodovar on the BAFTA award-winning film The Skin I Live In, which, oh my God, what an incredible movie. Delgado then earned an Oscar nomination for Les Miserables and The Danish Girl. Most recently, he dressed up mainstream Hollywood entertainments like The Jungle Cruise, for which he fashioned Dwayne Johnson's instantly memorable riverboat captain outfit. He recently finished work on John Wick 4, but none of these projects exceeded the breadth and depth of sartorial splendor showcased in Death on the Nile. Based on Agatha Christie's 1937 mystery, he and his team spent a year researching, designing, dyeing, cutting, and fabricating some 150 outfits for delivery in the fall of 2019 when filmmakers shot Death on the Nile in England's Long Cross Studios and in Morocco. Speaking from his home in Madrid, he compares Gal Gadot to 1930s movie star Carol Lombard and reveals himself to be something of a method designer. Great looking clothes mean nothing unless they reflect the character's motivations. He firmly believes all people have a very powerful tool to express themselves at their disposal, clothing. He feels these visual statements can be as strong and as emotionally stirring as the words they choose to say. Without further ado, it is my tremendous pleasure to welcome costume designer Paco Delgado to the Designing Hollywood podcast. Mr. Delgado, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much. I'm really overwhelmed about your, what you have said about me. I, I do what I can, what I can do. Well, let me, I, I need to ask you, like we were talking earlier just now before the show and, and you said you grew up. Uh, when you were growing up in the Canary Islands, that you were a fan of B movies and all kinds of, of of cinema. What were some of your early cinematic influences? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, I got to say the first, the really, really first uh, cinema influences where my grandmother used to live uh, near a sort of like a small repertoire cinema, and in summer. Uh, uh, I, I used to go to sleep with her and in her house. And in the summer she had, she kept the windows open and the cinema, the local cinema kept the windows open too. And then I remember like really, really vividly and I'm very, very, I'm, I'm a, it used to be very exciting to hear all the, all the Westerns and, and, and the conversations in the, in the screen, on the screen that we could hear from bed when we were like trying to sleep. Then that, that was super, super magical, I thought, you know. A little bit like cinema paradise, so you know. I mean, it, it, it really, really was was happening to to me, and that was that was that was the beginning, I think, of of some sort of like interest in this sort of like world. And then um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose to happen to a lot of people of my generation that you know, cinema was a very important thing. And and I remember my parents used to have this house in the countryside that we used to go all the weekends, but. Uh, I really wanted to, uh, I really remember me and my brother crying like we want to get back to our city because we wanted, we didn't want to lose the matinees on Sunday, on Sunday's afternoon and, and, uh, and watch, you know, all these amazing like Westerns, like Italian Westerns, spaghetti Westerns and, and all these peplums like, you know, I remember uh, a series called um, of, a, of a Roman hero called Masiste and, you know, like really, really, I don't know. I mean, all that made like, a, uh, I, th I suppose, like, uh, you know, like my, my wish to be part of this world, I suppose. Now, did you see yourself as getting into costume design? Was that something that you were interested in as a young man? Mm, no, really. I mean, the thing is, the thing is, um, I used to be a very, a fairly good student and uh, fairly good at sciences then. Um, I think myself, and I'm, I mean, you know, I mean, I suppose if you're very good at maths, then your your family, your 
your teachers, you know, yourself, you, you try to think, oh, you know, let's try, you know, let's take advantage of this opportunity. And I, I wanted to go to university and study uh, physics. And I did so. Uh, but at the same time, I was always very interested in, in, in theater and amateur theater. And then, um, and then the whole thing started growing and growing and growing. And then I realized, well, I'm not a good actor. It might be better that <laughs> might be better that I do something, you know, like behind the behind the scenes or something. And uh, I went to the Institute of Theatre in Barcelona because I wanted to I wanted to become a, a set designer. And um, I always I, I I think my career has been like a like a like a series of 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 how do you say like a strikes of of luck really because <laughs> I never I never understood how with very little experience and with no uh i mean i used to i used to draw when i was when i was young quite a lot but i didn't have like a sort of like a proper um artistic sort of like um um studies in a way and then i i, I always think how is it possible that they i went to that to the institute del teatro, del teatro that it was a very a very famous uh, theater institution in Barcelona, really old, like hundreds of years. And uh, I did the, the examination tests to, to be admitted. And, 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 and I was, what well, it was like, really fascinating, you know. <laughs> 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 I was thinking, how was it possible? Who, who I could cheat, you know? <laughs> and, well, um, the, the Spanish, I mean, the Spanish industry, so once you were at university, were you studying things like art history? I mean, a lot of the costume designers I've spoken to do have pretty rigorous academic backgrounds. Were you suddenly, did you just dive into all kinds of studies of artistic history or was it theater and cinema only? How, how did that happen for you? Well, it was, it was I mean, the thing is, I, the studies were like basically theater and, and, and art related, you know, performing arts. Um, I I wasn't I wasn't like really so sort of like I wasn't I, I didn't have like so sort of like lectures on history or but I always was very interested in history and especially especially in art um, contemporary art it's, you know I used to be very very interested in contemporary art and uh, well we have a country that with with a really really also really really rich uh, art art history you know then. I suppose, like, you know, I mean, I used to love to go to museums like Prado Museum or, you know, things like that. And, you know, I mean, I suppose that was the beginning, to be honest. But I think always, always, always uh, this sort of, like, thing from my childhood, uh, these influences of this uh, early matinees and uh, the, the, this this very magical thing that I was saying that when I was a child and, and I went to bed into my, into my gran granny's house and I could hear... I could hear this, the, you know, the, the sessions. I remember, like, they, they used to they used to show a lot of like uh, spaghetti westerns, and they were like, you know, the whole night like listening to 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 to, to people getting killed and all this sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did, then? Yeah. How how did you find? So you're in university, uh, and you're studying these things. How did you find yourself? becoming uh, involved in the actual film industry there in, in Barcelona or, or the rest of Spain? Well, I mean, as I said, you know, I mean, I, I, I did my studies and then I finished with very little um, sort of like practical experience uh, because the, 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 the studies in Spain used to be, you know, not, not anymore, but then they used to be very, very theoretical and very little practice. And then... I had a friend, I finished in Barcelona, and then I had a friend, an actress, that she used to work in commercial theater in Madrid. And uh, she told me, well, I mean, I'm working with this, uh, with this director and his set designer and costume designer, and uh, maybe you should call them and, uh, and ask them if they, if they have any sort of like open uh, position for you in, in any of his shows. And, and again, I don't know why I was like, you know, I mean, because I always, I suppose like everyone, I always find very, very hard to call people and say, well, listen, do you have any job for me? But <laughs> uh, I think I suppose I was very young and I had, I had nothing to lose. And, and then I called them, I called them and they said to me, well, that was maybe, I think it was like a Friday. And they said to me, well, could you be in Madrid on Monday and show us your, your drawings? And, you know, and we have a chat and you tell, you tell us 
what interests you in theatre, what interests you in cinema, and and then I just, you know, I just imagine I was like, uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I might be like 21 or 22 or 23, and I just like run and uh, put a portfolio together uh, <laughs> really unprofessionally, <laughs> and uh, and then I just like, you know, met them, and they like, I suppose they like more than they like my work, they like me maybe, and and, right. uh, and they get like a, like a job as a runner. And uh, then I started working with them, and and that was it, really. Basically, you know, I started working in commercial theatre in Madrid, and and um, and then I heard. Well, I, it was a very famous, sort of like very um, off off the track school in in London called Motley Theatre Design Course, that it was run by a woman called Percy Harris, uh, that she was a really really old lady, and. Uh, and she used to work with John Gilgood and Lawrence Olivier. Wow! It was part. Of, it was yeah. It was a, it was an institution in the in the in the in the English theatre, and she was one of the founders of the Royal Court. And and um, again, I she had this school that she got like ten students every year, and I just thought, well, why? Not? Well, I, well, I could try. I mean, you know, I mean, I have. I mean, I already, I already, I, I always have been very naive that way. I was thinking, well, maybe you know, maybe I have an opportunity, and then I just went to London, made a made a interview with with her and other other professors, the teachers of this school, and uh, I had really, really, really little knowledge of English then, and another miracle happened, and I don't know why <laughs> they took me up, <laughs> and then and then and then I started studying in London with them, and you know they were like. These people were pretty amazing because, you know, the, the, the whole stories they, they have to, you know, for example, Percy used to say, uh, uh, Peter Ustinov was such a, such a naughty child <laughs> because, <laughs> because she knew her, uh, his parents, that they were like uh, Russian emigres, that they, they, they were part of the, of the theater Moscow um, school. And then they came to to England as emigrants, like uh, you know, like fleeing from the revolution, and uh, and then you know she she had this all like first hand, um, not only theatre theatre knowledge, but also all these little gossipings and and you know, I mean, I remember she said to me once, um, um, oh, I remember. I went to the opening of uh, the Inspector of the Rose, you know, Nijinsky. And she said to me, Nijinsky was a great dancer, but the costumes were awful. And the costumes <laughs> were Leon Baxt, you know, that is considered like one of the, but because she was, she was, she was audience at the time. She had a, she had a, she had an op a critical opinion um, of the costumes, not really thinking that it was, a major icon of 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 costume designers, Leon Baxt. Then it was like you know, it was like really, it was that 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 really, really was really important. I think in my life, I'm really, really interested. In, Absolutely. You know. Well, you you've had a pretty your rise in the in the industry has been pretty spectacular, and you've you've had an opportunity to work with some great people. I mean, in Spain, you work with two of my favorite directors. You work with Alex. De La Iglesia and and of course Pedro Almodovar, who whose films I've been watching for oh since uh, for so long. I mean, what forty years now? And how did you find yourself working with those two directors? Well, the thing is, the thing is, I I, I started working um, in cinema, but by, by, again by one of those. Well, I, I suppose like everyone, by the chance you have a friend that says. Um, um, they are looking for runners for this movie, and uh, why don't you come along? I introduce you to the designer, and you know, blah 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 blah. Then I went, I met the designer, I got a job. Then I started like working with this designer that she was, co she's called um, Sonia Grande. She's a she's a great designer and works with Woody Allen and, and many people. And uh, and uh, and then I started working with her. And uh, um, and with another designer as well as 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 assistant, and I did my first movie with Alex because uh, I was assisting another designer called Lala Wete that she was designing a movie called uh, Muertos de Risa, Death of Laughter. I don't know how it was translated into English, and um, and 
we were all very young and uh, Alex was very young as well. And I think we just saw like clipped together. And in the next movie, <laughs> Um, she, he called me instead of calling the, 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 the designer I used to work for. <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh my God, because she's a good friend of mine. I thought Lala is not going to talk to me anymore, but we're still very, very good friends. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then I started working with him. I did a movie called La Comunidad. I think, I don't know how it's called in English. Um, I, I just know it as that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and uh, it was a movie with obviously with a very very little budget. Uh, I think we just like shot for maybe six weeks, and I remember I had the prepping of four weeks maybe. And it was like you know, I mean, I had a lot of fun and uh, fun and misery as well because you know movies are, are like a roller coaster of a roller roller coaster coaster of emotions sometimes, and. Uh, and uh, I don't know, at the beginning, I didn't used to like cinema as a worker because I, as I said, I came from the theater as well. And I used to find cinema very, very complicated, very sort of like harsh and everything quick and people screaming and a lot of like stress. And uh, <laughs> uh, because Alex used to used to scream a lot. I mean, I suppose has, now he has tamed with age, but and um He's, he 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 had a lot of temperament and 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 um, you know very Spanish, and uh, and then I I I I finished this first movie and I thought well you know this is an experience I, I think it has been alright but I don't want to come back to this and then suddenly little by little you know you you start you forget all the bad moments and just remember the good ones and then. You know, I mean, movies are like a drug, really. You know, cinema is cinema is like it really hooks you. I think it hooks you or or or, or repels you forever. But you know, in that case, it was a huge. You know, I mean, it really hooked me. I really, I really felt that it was a very interesting job uh, from the artistic side, and uh, I always like to tell stories. And I think that was a, a, a you know, movies obviously are a great way to tell stories and also a good way to work in community with other people and share the same interests and working together and being together in the nice moments and in the bad moments. You know, I just, you know, it was, uh, I, it, I, it, I don't know, I just felt that it was like something I, I, I could do well. Well, I mean, I have to say you, you did, you do do it well. And, you know, I love the work that you did, like the skin I live in, was uh, also bad education. The, the work you did with Almodovar was amazing. And working your way up, did you ever think coming from the theater that you would do the movie version of, of Les Miserables? Because my God. No, because also I'm going to be, I'm going to be quite honest. I don't like musicals. <laughs> I've done a few of them. Um, I like some musicals, for example, I love West Side Story and but, I mean, Definitely, Le Mis wasn't a, 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 a musical I really liked then. Now I like it because well, it's part of my my life as well. And and after you 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 have you have been in a project for a whole year, listening to the music like you know like a like a like a like a in your in the background of your mind constantly like a like a, you know I mean you end up like loving it. And um, no, I I mean. I, the thing is, as I said, I, I never have expected anything. It's just like, uh, I mean, I, I think most of the things have happened in my life because I was in the right place at the right moment, you know? I mean, it happened with Tom Hooper that, you know, that was, uh, that he came to Spain to do a, a very long commercial with uh, Captain Morgan, and then, uh, it happens that if you are working in Spain or you have worked, for example, with Almodovar, every director that comes into the country wants to interview you because, right. you know, well, well, I mean, you know, because, you know, they, 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 they know the director and they, a lot of them, Pedro is a very appreciated director, I think, mainly international, even more than in Spain, perhaps. Mm. And um, he, I had an interview with him and then he called me for the job. And then we, again, we saw like clip. We, we had a very, very good relationship working. And then he said to me, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, this big uh, movie for, uh, I think it was uh, Universal. Uh, that, uh, yeah, it was Universal. I'm doing this big movie for Universal. And maybe 
maybe you would be interested in it. And I just thought, well, this is a typical thing that you are you are having a good time with the director, then he disappears from 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 your from your life or from your, or from the movie or from the from the work you're doing, and next time you see him in a pub in London, he doesn't even remember your name or your face, you know. <laughs> Well, yeah, because uh, you know this is this is the uh, things that happens a lot, and then I just like um, I was <laughs> I was uh, with my partner then the other time, and um, I got this phone call from the states, and I thought, mm, how weird. At the beginning, I didn't want to take it up because I thought, how weird somebody calling me from the states because I didn't have then any, any international career at all. But then I, I, fin I finally picked up the phone, and they they said, well, you know, we are calling you because uh, on behalf of Tom Hooper because he would be very interesting very interested to know if you have uh, any interest of doing this movie with us and and maybe you are up for an interview we are interviewing other people but maybe you will be interested in it and and yeah then I did it and and um, and uh, the interview was I went to London the interview wasn't going very very well it wasn't a little bit like that but uh, uh, one of the producers that it was Cameron Mackintosh. That is, he has the right. I think he has. He had the rights, or then at least, uh, of the of the musical. Uh, ask me. Um, oh, you speak you speak fairly good English. Why is that? And I said, well, you know, because I study here in London with this lady called Percy Harris, and the school is more. And he said, and after that, he obviously knew Percy very well. Uh, he said. He said to everyone in the in the meeting, "Well, this is one of the best uh, this uh, theatre designers schools here in London." And then after that, the whole interview took another another another. I don't know how to say in English, rumbo, like you know, another 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 way. And uh, <laughs> they said, "The job is yours." I went to I went to a Chinese restaurant to have some some lunch. And I thought I was going back to Madrid, just and they will call me at some point. And and before I finished the the I finished the lunch in the in Chinatown, they just called me and said, uh, "Paco, you got the job." <laughs> <laughs> I just I love the fact that you're a man who doesn't like musicals, and yet you worked on both Les Misérables and Cats, which are two of the biggest musicals of all time. <laughs> yeah, we 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 we're very we very different luck in in in, in both of them. <laughs> One was a big hit and the other one was a big flop. Then, you know. <laughs> yeah, but your work was great in both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, your stuff well, was I mean, great. I always say, I always say, in the same way that I'm not, I don't believe uh, a lot of uh, um, when people come and say you are, you did a great job and and the reviews are amazing. I never believe it completely. In the same way, I don't believe when people say you did a shit. You know, it's like <laughs> it's like. It's like um, it's a good. It's a good. I think it's a good trait of my personality that I don't like uh, the streams of adulation or or the deprecation. You know, I just like, I just like. I'm. I'm. I'm I don't know. I mean, I think you know, both movies were interested in a way, and um, both movies have faults, and and uh, for me, they are important in my career because I always see every job is a is a way to develop um, as an artist or as a costume designer or as a, as a as a worker in the industry then you know well then you found yourself getting at nominations for academy awards what mm. was what was that like for you well i mean <laughs> you know i mean i don't know what to say it's just like the first time it was uh, so so I, it was it was it wasn't unexpected because as you know, you get all this, all this, um, um, you know, I mean, in, in the Hollywood Reporter and everywhere, it's like the possible nominations of the year. And I didn't, I didn't follow any of those things, but I had always friends like, you know, I just read that your work in, in, uh, in Le Mis might be, is really appreciated and maybe you get a nomination. And I never paid any attention. Because I, I was thinking, well, that's completely stupid. And, <laughs> um, but, uh, well, no, because, I, you know, I mean, the thing is, it also, I mean, I suppose if you are, if you have a career in Hollywood, or you have had a career in Hollywood, or you are from LA, or even if you are from, I don't know, from Calabasas or whatever, or <laughs> right. from Orange County, I mean, you, you, you have much more so like, 
I don't know, more opportunities or, or you see the whole thing closer to you. But as I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a person from a very small island, um, working in Madrid at the time, working internationally, I started to work internationally, but and it wasn't, it wasn't yet sinking into my mind. And then when I got nominated, I was like, I was like super, it was like a really strange feeling because in one, in one, on one side, I felt wow. On another side, I thought, why is this happening to me? <laughs> it's like, uh, do I deserve this? You know? Of course you do. Yes, you did. Well, no, I don't know, but you, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, no, of know, course, like, of course. I felt like I felt like super overwhelmed, and then you know, I, 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 I obviously you do, you do your your. Uh, I remember Juliana Makovsky. I went to, I went to, I went to uh, a meeting in the in the in the in one of the meetings of 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 of, um, of the Costume Designers Guild, and Juliana Makovsky told me, um, if they if they nominate you, it's really bad because you had to spend a lot of money for clothes and, and for different things and i was like okay well then better that they don't nominate me and <laughs> uh, and then yeah and then i got the nomination and then, you know it was it was fun it was the, especially the first time was like you know i mean you felt yourself very well like living like a like a tale you know like a like a sort of fairy tale well, then you, you came to America and you, you worked for M. Night Shyamalan on both Split and Glass, two movies I, mm. I quite enjoyed. You know, that those are both Blumhouse, Blumhouse films. And I guess in a way, uh, which kind of in a way led you to Disney because Glass, <laughs> Glass, it was Unbreakable was the first film in that mm -hmm. series. And, yeah. um, and then you worked for Anna DuVernay on A Wrinkle in Time which mm. also had some beautiful costume work. And that was a, mm. also a Disney film. And you found yourself uh, working on, on two big Hollywood movies. You were Jungle Cruise with mm -hmm. a Spanish director, right? Yes. And yes, yes. A, a great with guy. Jama. Great guy. Jama's a great guy. And, um, yes. and then uh, you were working on um, uh, uh, Death on the Nile with Kenneth Branagh directing. I mean... Mm. So, so you had these two monstrous projects. Uh, I guess mm. let, let's start with with Jungle Cruise. I mean, obviously based on a on a ride. I've got to ask you before you started working on it. Did you go to Disneyland and ride on the Jungle Cruise ride? Well, I don't. I don't know if Disney is going to like this, but the answer is no. <laughs> 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 Do no, you ever I mean, go? I, have you ever been on the Jungle Cruise ride? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have been after, I have been after, but not not before. The thing is, the thing is, at the time, uh, I think Disney was trying to rethink the uh, the ride because the ride had sort of like it was one of the, the I think it was the first ride or one of the first rides in in, in the, the park, parks, the most uh, the most uh, successful one, or at least during a long time. But I think it was aging in a in a in not in the right way, maybe some of it. Right. And you know, I mean, it has like some some sort of visions about about um, about uh, people living in the jungle and things like that. They were like a little bit up, you know, out of date. Yes. And not very not very politically correct. Then then I think you know that was one of the main reasons that Disney wanted to create this. Uh, this uh, franchise or this or this or this movie you know and um I, it was a lot of fun because jama is jama is i want to say a, an adorable director a really great person really easy to work with him very encouraging and uh, very 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 super talented and and um uh, and uh, it was very nice to be working in the States with a, a Spanish director we could communicate in our language. It was, it was like, you know, it was like, I mean, I had a lot of fun. It was like a really, really fun project to do. Now, I mean, a great cast, obviously one of the big movie stars in the world right now, Dwayne Johnson, and of course, uh, Emily Blunt, who another, I mean, coming back and playing Mary Poppins. So she was obviously mm. somebody Disney loved. How did you begin? How does one start making clothes for a man as large as Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> How do you begin? How did, what, what did you well, do? What was the inspiration for his, his riverboat captain for you? 
Well, I mean, the thing is, the thing is, I normally try to, I always say that one of the main, the most amazing things about my job is they pay me to learn. Uh, it's like people have to, a lot of people have to pay, or well, mostly everyone has to pay for the education, but uh, as people who work in, in, in the industry, they pay you for research. They pay you to learn things, to get into new worlds To, And I, I, find, I, I find this is amazing. Then, you know, I mean, when I, when I was reading, obviously when you read a script, uh, I suppose it happens to everyone. I, I, at my first, um, I, read, I read everything like almost like with a blank mind and I leave my mind to go everywhere. You know, it's like the same way where you are reading a, a novel and you, if the novel is very well written or is, is getting to you, you are capable of feeling what the smells of the streets will be and what the temperatures will be and what, uh, if the atmosphere will be full of a smoke or cigarettes. So, you know, you, you start thinking a lot of, not, not, just, not just the look of everything, but also sensations. And I, when I was reading, um, when I was reading uh, Jungle Cruise, I mean, I always had in my mind, and I suppose it was part of the whole thing, I had uh, African Queen and Mogambo always in my mind. Mm. I don't know. I mean, it came like really, really naturally. And, and the whole, the whole iconography came from both of them, you know. I mean, I, I have to say quite proudly that I copied the looks from, from Humphrey Bogart in Queen of Africa uh nearly nearly up to the t sure and uh, and uh and emily is dressed like um, i would say 95 percent like uh eva garner in mogambo you know i mean i i just saw uh, eva garner in in a in a in a green shirt blouse in the jungle and i thought this is it and then <laughs> The, the the DOP that is a really, really great friend of, of mine and of Chama as well, he was like, but how do you dare to dress somebody green in green in the jungle? <laughs> <laughs> it's already green. This is not going to work. <laughs> sure it is. Was, It'll work and fine. Was, and, and it I did, by the way. Smart. It worked great. Yeah, because I thought if you work in Mogambo, why it's not going to work here? And... Um, and uh, I thought it was a great color for her as well. And I also, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I also, I, I hate when, when you get in movies and people think that you have to contrast with the background. So, you know, you, that, that you have to wear like another different, this is a very, for me, a very old fashioned way to, to work uh, colors in colors in cinema and in costumes. I just thought, well, you know, it's much better that she is, she's part of the jungle herself, you know, I mean, She's, she's green, the jungle is green, then, you know, you can sort of like mimetize and sort of like establish some sort of like connections, you know. And um, I think it worked. I mean, you know, I mean, um, I hope so. Did Dwayne Johnson uh, like being, uh, did you like it, it looking like the, the new, the modern Humphrey Bogart? Yeah, I think he did. I mean, you know, I didn't have any problem with him at all. I mean, he, he embraced the costumes from the very, very beginning and, and uh, his agent and everyone really liked them. It was like it was like a love at the at the first, uh, um, you know. Yeah, it was like. Oh, you look great. I mean, he... well, I mean, you know, I mean, the thing is, I mean, I, I, you know, I watch the movie and and I think sometimes that some of his uh, um, uh, how do you call uh, sus suspenders. Right. Suspenders, they are like a little bit too bright. So one, one pair that he was wearing is like a little, a little too yellow, I think. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but that's because I'm very critical with myself. And I was like, you know, look at, I was, I, I'm always very unsatisfied, and uh, how do you say, unsatisfied with uh, my work in movies. I was like, I always criticize myself quite. Uh, the only movie I haven't criticized myself is a really, uh, uh, again, a really tiny movie but really wonderful that I did uh, back in Spain um, after years working abroad called, uh, based on Snow White called Blanca Nieves and it's a black and white movie, uh, Silent. Mm. And uh, that's the only movie I had. Uh, it, it opens in San Sebastian uh, Film Festival and I went to the premiere and I completely forgot that I, 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 I was a costume designer. <laughs> and. <laughs> And uh, it really, really saw like, um, you know, I mean, it, it was, it was, it was wonderful to see, a, to see one of your jobs and being capable of, 
I forget completely that you did it, you know. <laughs> well, then, then I mean, a movie that uh, just leapt off the screen, the costume design was just sumptuous. And that was, of course, Kenneth, Kenneth Branagh's second Agatha Christie mystery, Death on the Nile, with an amazing cast, Kenneth Branagh mm-hmm. directing mm-hmm. again. Uh, those costumes were amazing. I mean, that you, you know, you talked about in an interview that you believed in method designing, that the costumes should, should bring the characters to sort of, to sort of life as much as the actors do. And I think you really nailed it. And how you had a huge team developing those costumes and you were looking at, um, old Hollywood and and you were looking at old designers and Paris Vogue's. How did you begin the process of creating the costumes for Death on the Nile? Well, I, I think because because uh, I always I, I, I always start with a script. Uh, maybe because I, I again coming back to what I was speaking before, um, I started with this lady called Percy Harris that she was a really really big believer on on the text and the story that you have to tell is uh, is. You know, I mean, it has to be based some, a lot in the scripts. Then I started reading the scripts, and then I started having feelings again. And then I just thought the period was the period that Kenneth wanted to set uh, the movie was a little bit later than the the novel itself. Um, he wanted to set it up in 1937. That is just uh, uh, a couple of years before the the Second World War, and um, and uh, and it's a really interesting moment in fashion because um, uh, most of the fashion that it was that it was being developed at the point uh, got so like truncated, truncated you can say like mm-hmm. got cut it yeah, by the truncated. war. Yes, and then it, it was like a really so like a strange period that uh, didn't develop completely and properly. Then I, I got started getting fascinated by that. Um, a lot of the silhouettes already looked very very 40s and uh, and uh, and i thought that was super interesting and also i just thought that um at that time um um you know i mean you you might say nowadays you, we i mean or young people or uh, are fascinated maybe with singers with you know with pop singers or with or with uh with uh, models or but at that time the big big fascination was hollywood and and the star system then i just thought you know i mean i mean if you are rich at the time and you really want to portray yourself like you are you are amazing and some of them are really so like they are not it, they were not people or not of the or not all of them were people with all money what is like another type of 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 aesthetic they were like a lot of like you know new newcomers and um, people who inherited money by you know by or people who lost money because the whole the whole the whole story is is, is based on sexual attraction and, and 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 the wish to have money you know and greed. Then it's like you know I just I just thought it really look it really looked to me like very easy to think in Hollywood at the time. And uh, and Kenneth wanted to make a movie. He said to me, I, "I want to make a movie that is is obviously period, but it doesn't look like period in the way that you know. I don't want to have people with heavy. I want I want to I want to I want you to find what in the period was really, will you say, depurated, like you know, like like clean lines and and." Um, and then that was that was the point of departure. And then I, you know, I just I just thought Carol Lombard would be interesting for Gal, for Gal Gadot, and uh, she really loved the idea because, um, again, it's one of those things that you think. And then she said to me, "Well, that's really funny you're telling me because I was having lunch or dinner or something with with uh, Francis Ford Coppola the other day, and he said to me that she that he rem- that I I reminded him of Carol Lombard, and it was like. You know, and there was a, I was like, well, if 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 Coppola told you that, then I think this is it. We have to follow it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then yeah, I mean, I, and everyone. I, I was I was trying I was I was trying to find 
because this is an ensemble uh, cast all working together all the time uh, of people that of a certain level, like, you know, like uh, a spoil, what we usually say today is spoil rich brats or something like that, you know, people right. <laughs> who never have work, never have had any, any problem. Some of them have real problems, but they pretend they don't. And, uh, and, uh, and then I just thought, you know, it will be very interesting to sort of like develop uh, every character from the point of view of the costumes and uh, and uh, that was my main aim, you know, just just how the costumes can show people. And I like to work sometimes in in by you know by going on the contrary. And for example, I just thought um, I just thought for example the two main women characters, you know, Lynette and uh, and. Uh, and uh, Jacqueline de Beaufort, I just thought um, it seems like the one who is the strong one is, is uh, Gail's character, but in fact, the strong one is the other one because she is, she is consumed by, by, by jealousy and, and love, and that's a, such a powerful sort of like um, late motif to, to, to carry on, on in life, just revenge. And then I thought, you know, I mean, she has to look always like much more passionate and much more strong than Li than Lynette. Well, Lynette is like this sort of like little flower all the time in these coarse pastels and whites and and uh, and creams and silks. And then the other one is always red and and uh, and you know and and sort of like you know fierce. Then. I started building the, 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 these two characters, and then the other the other characters started so like developing by themselves, you know, in contrast or in association with these two. Um, well, they, I mean, yeah. the costumes are just uh, they're absolutely incredible. Now, did you have a large team of people creating these costumes? Because you built everything from scratch, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We built everything. Um, I mean, this this was this movie was. Uh, hard to make in the sense that it was a lot of work, but it was so much fun. I mean, I, I, it will, I will really always keep in my memory a movie like this. We had a long, we have a, we have a, 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 a sort of like fairly good size, I would say, um, uh, workroom. Maybe, maybe we were in total, maybe, I don't know. Sometimes I think we were like 50, 60 people perhaps. And uh, we were like doing everything like, you know, like, uh, Obviously, all the cutting and the sewing, but then dyeing the fabrics. Most of the fabrics we started with with fabrics in in cream or white, and we dyed them in the colors we wanted. And the people embroidering, and uh, I mean, it was like people painting on fabrics. It was like uh, we had a millionaire, two millionaires on site, and um, I don't know. It was it was it was one of those movies that you know they don't come so often, but. I mean, I had the luck to do this one, I, took, I suppose. I had well, a lot of fun. Really. You, you have a great eye for color. And, you know, I, I think probably that's why you work with Almodovar, because color is so important to, mm. to his, his films. How did, you, how did you sort of develop your color palette, the rich palette you use in your clothing? Where do you think that came from? Because it couldn't well, have just, it couldn't have just been you said how, you know, you were lucky to get these jobs, but you got these jobs because of your talent. And where do you think your love of color or the use of color in your work came from? Well, I always think that all my aesthetic, all my aesthetic comes from my island. I always think that it has to do with my childhood, and uh, and uh, the island I'm from is is a volcanic island. It's basically black. Mm. The, all the all the sand is black, like black ashes, like very similar to what you could find in in Hawaii, and uh, and then the sky is like really really super blue, and it's very very little vegetation, uh, but then here and there you know you see like a like a plant with a with a red flower, and in contrast with it with the black it makes a very sort of like dramatic impact. And I think it comes from that. I don't know. I no, mean, that absolutely, that makes perfect sense to me. I never would have thought about that, but absolutely. Because it really comes through. And now in the, in the movie, Gal Gadot wears the, um, the 128 carat yellow Tiffany diamond. Is it true? Mm. Is it true that was on loan from mm, Tiffany? 
Well, I mean, the thing is, it's, it's true that the diamond uh, is was from Tiffany, but uh, it was a replica, basically. Okay. Uh, because you mean they uh, wouldn't give you a 128 carat diamond for the movie no i mean we i think we had it for some some photographs or some sort of like uh um but i mean it would be like imagine working with it with a diamond of those characteristics no. it was already quite hard that um uh, tiffany was really really super helpful and uh, they gave us they made they made uh, two or, or three replicas of this diamond this 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 color with a diamond for us to to use, and they lend me a lot a lot of like real, real uh, pieces from their from their archives, mm. like you know, and um, it was quite uh, it was quite uh, amazing, but at the same time it's scary because you were like <laughs> right. working we were working with pieces that you know I mean they have a story in, in themselves not only just 1930s not only just the 1930s bracelet but the bracelet that maybe uh i don't know gary cooper bought to her wife to his wife and then because um uh tiffany had a had a uh, the, the, the what they do is like they try to rebuy uh some of the iconic pieces from their customers mm. and especially if they have belonged to rich people i mean you know if uh if if somebody inherits a piece then they do a bid for it because they 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 want to. They have a really amazing archive, right? And um, and then you know it was like, I mean it was funny because for example somebody somebody like um, Annette Benning, uh, she thought it was so overwhelming to wear all this real real jewelry that she said to me, Paco, if you don't mind, I think I prefer to wear like replicas because <laughs> because then I don't need yeah because the thing is if you wore one of those authentic things you have always with you somebody from Tiffany following you uh, on the set when you were coming out of set, uh, always like really worried that you were going to rub the, 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 the you know, the diamond bangles. The wrong the way. Yeah. They were going to, to scratch the diamonds. You know, it was like, then, you know, I mean, for example, somebody like, somebody so amazing, like, like Annette was like, you know, I mean, I think I actually, I prefer not to wear them. <laughs> Let's do some replicas. And then, you know, we can, I can feel free to be myself, you know. Did you have a favorite of, of all the things you made for Death on the Nile? Did you have something that was your favorite? Well, it was like, it was really funny because every, every, every week that we produce, I can't remember how many costumes per week, but every week we used to say, this is the best we have made so far. And then uh, the following week, we do, did another thing completely different. And we, we start, we, 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 we thought again, oh, no, no, this is much better than the one we did last week. I don't know. I mean, I have, I mean, the thing is because the characters were so different. I mean, you know, because uh, Gal was dressed in a style. I, for example, for Gal, I really love the the dress we made, the chiffon dress that she wears in her wedding. Um, and uh, it's a very simple dress, but it took us like a long, long, long time to get to get it right. And um, for for Emma, that she played Jacqueline, I, I really like uh, the first dress when she is dancing in the club. And uh, I loved all the costumes of uh, of uh, Rosalie. Mm. waterborne beautiful uh, because it was like very flamboyant and it was a lot of fun and and uh, and sophie oconedo is an amazing character herself and and so she just embraced the clothes so much and she was always very happy to she was always like uh waiting to find what was the next uh, number for her you know it was <laughs> like it was very exciting working oh it was exciting working for everyone it was such a such a nice 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 ensemble cast um um, I, I have only good memories from them because sometimes you work in movies and you get some tough cookies here and there. But you know, right. <laughs> in this case, it wasn't like that. It was like a, it was like a really, really, really enjoyable uh, cast to work with. And I well, think you I, can see that in costumes. Oh, it absolutely comes through in the movie and the costumes as well. I mean, it's, it's just, it just it leaps off the screen how much fun you all must have been having. But speaking mm. of fun. You did a movie after that with Pedro Pascal and the great Nicolas Cage. You did Unbearable <laughs> Weight of Massive Talent. Now, how much fun was that movie to do? Well, I mean, that movie was, it was actually, it was a very simple movie, or it looks like very simple, but it was really hard to make. 
because we did it in in, in full pandemic in uh, when you know i mean we uh, we did in nine, in 2020 uh uh we started in summer in 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 hungary uh we saw like a gap of but it seems like it seems like covid is uh, receding i think it's the end of it <laughs> let's go to hungary to do this movie <laughs> and then we ended up in hungary and as soon as we got there uh, the whole thing escalated back again, like the, the famous second wave, and and we ended up like you know working with almost everything shut, uh, shops closed. Um, uh, we had to buy everything over the internet, but because it wasn't it wasn't that many flights at the time, because most of the most of the of the of the air air communication was cut down. Uh, you know, anything that you, you order, I mean, you know, we had to order fabrics and everything on the internet and, uh, and, uh, I wasn't very used to that at the time because, you know, I mean, I was like to work, uh, feeling things in my hands. I'm very tactile and I, I like to see how things look, not only how they look, how they, how they, 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 they feel, how they move, how they, and that was quite hard to do, but also it was, it wasn't not only that it was just like normally. If you order something on the internet, you can have it in two days or one day, and, and at that time, anything, any the quickest was one week. Then it was it was super. It was it was interesting, but it was hard as well. But then, I mean, you know, again, uh, Ni Nicolas Cage is a, is an amazing character himself. It's just <laughs> like you know, I mean, bigger than life itself, and uh, we had a lot of fun with him, and uh, yeah, and, and you know, it was good. It was good. Now, I guess to wrap up. I mean, I have a very varied career. You know, I mean, I cannot say I have a gender. I have done. I think I have done nearly everything. Oh, you and you have. I mean, it's. I I like the fact that you've worked on so many diverse kinds of films. You know, whether they're musicals, whether they're mysteries, whether you're wrapping somebody up in in gauze, like in the skin I live in. You know, so they have to walk around like they're in uh, uh, eyes without a face. I mean, you've really done it all. Now. All, I, I would be remiss. You have coming up John Wick Four. Now, uh, you know the John Wick series sort of came out of nowhere to become a huge success, and I, I want to ask you. You know, you came in on the fourth movie of that franchise, and one of the interesting things about the John Wick franchise is the world in which it takes place. It takes place in a very different kind of a of a, a heightened world, you know, and, and, uh, of international intrigue and mystery and everybody's, everybody's beautiful suits are bulletproof. <laughs> so when, when, well, yeah. when you came on to John wick four, how much, uh, freedom did you have to sort of design all of the, cause the, and again, all these great actors, all these great, uh, characters that you're designing for, whether it's, you know, uh, oh, do we? Uh, what was it like for you to come on to John Wick Four, the fourth movie in a franchise? Uh, um, I'm, um, well, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, we can okay. See you. My, my image is frozen, and I thought maybe you couldn't hear me. Oh, um, I can hear you. Well, I mean, the, um, I, do, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, I had worked with Chad before. Um, and, the dir uh, the director. With, yeah, with the director. Sorry, Chad. Chad. Stashelsky, and uh, he called me to do this this movie, and I was like, um, I thought, well, you know, it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's, a, it's it's another different genre that I haven't done before, like you know, movies with a lot of uh, action, like a really, really highly action movie, and um, and uh, and I thought it was very interesting to try to be faithful to to the saga because obviously obviously it's you know i just came with a character that it was already developed and you know and so i always insisted in in that in this fact you no know? you know when i was having all the fittings with with uh with keanu i was always like um asking him what do you think what do you think is this john wick is this uh the john wick you are used to because I mean, I didn't want to be. I didn't. I didn't think I need to invent anything. I mean, right. the, the saga was already was already very very successful, and and uh, in a case like that, you have to you have to be quite humble and 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 
and uh, decide that what you what you have to do is do be a continuation of the work that, that the other the other the other designers have made before. Then, um, but the thing is, I think you know. I mean, I, I hope I I brought um, my my style into it, and because uh, I, I mean, this is not the first time I work with a person with. Or the person or with a project that already has a very prefix style. I mean, when you work with Pedro Almodovar, you are already you are already working in a world, right? That is has been it has been pre-established. I mean, you know, you have very little. You you have to. I think it's interesting to work in projects where you have to work in a really narrow path. You know that that you can. It's not. It's not like the whole. It's not like an open field. It's just like a path that you already has been traced and you have to you have to know how to work work in it and develop a story or, or a look from it and i i don't know i mean i hope i mean we had a lot of fun because uh part of this movie was uh, supposed to be happening in japan oh really part of the movie is set in japan <laughs> yes uh well you know the whole movie has already like a very very um uh, sort of like um um, philosophy, like a like a Eastern sort of like philosophy, based in in the samurai code, and and uh, then you know it was like it was very interesting to try to develop a, a a world that it was based. It was a real world, but it had a tiny bit of fantasy. You know, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how to how to say how it was. It was like it was like I always wanted to, I, I always wanted in the movie to portray something that it was believable from the point of view of reality, but it had this sort of like bias. And I think Japan is very good for that because I don't know if you know Japan, but you go to Japan and it's a very strange feeling because uh, in one side, you think they're so close to us is so many elements of the Western world, but at the same time, they are so far away from us because <laughs> it's, they have nothing to do with us in a way, culturally, uh, but at the same time, very, very close. And I think that's that's already a a a a, a sort of like a meta uh, language or a meta thinking. You know, I mean that that you already are working in two different levels: the level mm. of reality, the one you recognize as really close to you, like everyone or mostly everyone is dressing or in in westernized costumes and they 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 use cars and they they are highly um you know like t the technology is like really so like westernized or, or or we have we have our technology is very easternized i don't know how to say it, but right no i know. understand um, but then at the same time you know they have all these traditions and they still have their their so like a really really close world where um honor and uh, family and uh and traditions really, really matter. Things that we have sort of like almost up the soul of the of their society is like still very vibrant. That we, I think, in the Western world, we have abandoned some of it. You know. Well, now let so, me ask you this: on a, on a movie like an act, you said action was a new genre for you. How many copies of of doubles, or how many like of of one of John Wick's suits? How many copies well, I, did you have to make? I think I have lost the track. I mean, I can I cannot <laughs> even tell you, but. I mean, mm, I don't know, 20, 30, I can't remember. Wow. But, you know, we did, we, I mean, you know, it was like always, because I mean, it's, 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 it's an action movie to a level that, you know, everyone is fighting and, you know, and things are happening all the time and you have Keanu and then you have a stunt double and then you have the stunt double and the stunt double and then you have the guy who has to um, jump from a, from a window and then you have the guy who has to drive a car and Keanu makes a lot of his own stunts. You know, he's he's uh, he's very, very, very well known for doing a lot of his stunt work. Or I would say most of it. And it was always like, you know, I had the people on set always calling me and screaming, "Ah, we are running out of suits. <laughs> Everything has holes now." You know, and then <laughs> I mean, you know, I can't remember. We have we have we have a tailor almost like making the costumes for him all the time like repeating and making repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats well i'm looking so forward to that well listen before we end the interview let me ask you a lot of a lot of people that watch designing hollywood are, are up and coming designers or people that want to get into the industry what advice can you give to 
people that are just just starting out they want to get into costume design or they want to get into production design what can you tell them they should concentrate on well i would say like it's super important um to be yourself being open to opportunities uh think that it's no it's you know that no no job is about job every job will bring you something or some of them will bring you knowledge some of them will bring you uh links with another friend some of them will bring you money i mean that's important too and uh and uh some of them will uh help you to advance as a designer and this is a very important thing but, but almost i would say that it's very important to make connections with people that you feel that understands you and uh, that you understand them and uh, you can create especially i think at the beginning it's very important to create a a, a a, a, a community of of fellow uh, um, colleagues, friends, uh, people with the same interests as you, and start doing uh, work together. You know, it can be something that you can uh, make with an iPhone, or something you can make uh, just in in the corner of, of 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 a cafe, just like speaking to each other. Or you know, I mean, I think it's it's very 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 different ways to get into cinema, not I mean, in, in my case, what I said to you, a lack, a strikes of luck, I, th I always think. Um, but it's very, very many ways to... And the other thing, I always say, this is not a sprint a race. It's a marathon. Yes. And uh, and uh, you, you have to think that it's a long, long distance uh, course. And... Uh, you you might think that you are not getting there or you're not getting where you want to and then one day suddenly um suddenly you realize that yes you are doing what you want doing what you love and uh and being happy with it you know well this has been so great paco i i, I very much appreciate your time uh do you have a social media presence can people follow you on say instagram well i have facebook um but i hardly i have decided to stop using it like uh, a couple of years ago i have an instagram but i never use it okay <laughs> i never put anything i'm really crap i don't know i mean i'm <laughs> now more into um because i mean the thing is i mean I'm, i i might i sh maybe i shouldn't say that but i just think that that all this social media what it what it makes at the end is to give you a lot of uh, a world of insatisfaction insatisfaction that you are living the life of others when you should be living the life of yourself um, right it's a it's a very interesting sentence by oscar wilde that says be yourself every every other person is already is already believed you know then i think it's that's super important it's not that I'm against them. It's just like, I think I got bored of them. You know? Sure. Well, I, mean, Pop, I, <laughs> I, I totally understand that. Totally understand. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm now enjoying very much to read books or, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 back, I'm going back to, I, I used to be a really, really big book reader when I was young. And then um, because the career and, you know, because you never have got time and you start like running and everything. But lately, um, I lost my 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 mom last year, and uh, it just made me feel that um, there's there are very very many important things in life that you shouldn't abandon. And one of them is to read, for example, to get back to reading. I completely and, agree. Uh, do, do you have favorite authors? Uh, well, um, I have very very many different. I mean, I love what I I love to read because I'm a, I'm a, I love gossiping. I love to read uh, books based on on letters epistles you know like a uh, like letters of people sending letters to each other you know the letters of of Klimt or or or, or you know like um, the, the 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 book of letters of madame de sevigny all these sort of things i really really enjoy i mean I'm, I'm, and uh, but now i'm living a, i'm reading a book about uh, about uh, the one of the last kings of poland stanislav Poniatowski. And written by by an amazing Mexican uh, <laughs> writer, that she was one of her descendants, Elena Poniatowska. Wow! And, uh, and that is is uh, 
it's uh, it's really you know I'm enjoying it a lot. It's really interesting. I love it. I love I love I I love uh, especially English lit literature and Spanish or Hispano you know Hispano America mm. literature. I, I, the problem with books is so many things to read. You know? I know. I know. I mean, I always. I mean, I always. I always. I. 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 I'm not a big reader, for example, of Russian books, and I always regret it because I really recently read The Idiot, uh, Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. and I really, really enjoyed it. I thought, my God, how could I? Who, how could I uh, spend so many years without reading it? You know, and uh, and oh, one of my dreams is to read War and Peace. Sure. But uh, but I think you need. To, you need to have like a, you know, you need to be convalescent or something for a year and a half or something <laughs> to be capable of reading it. Well, Paco Delgado, this has been so much fun, such an honor to speak with you today. I, I want to thank you so much for being here on the Designing Hollywood show. Well, thank you very much. It has been a great uh, time with you and uh, I really have enjoyed it. It's always nice to come back to your career and just think why do you do things because you normally don't think about what you have done or, or why you have done things and it's always very good to dig a little bit into it it's almost like coming to the to the psychoanalysis um uh <laughs> consult <laughs> you know well this has been terrific but uh no i think you have a good head on your shoulders <laughs> you don't need psychoanalysis <laughs> but thank you no, so I, <laughs> I psychoanalyze myself quite quite a lot <laughs> you know well, thanks so much for being here. And a special thanks to our sponsor, Paris Costumes. Paris Costumes has been a part of the history of the European theater, film, and television industry since 1856 and has become 21st century tailors. And as always, thank you to our guest costume designer, Jenny, for coming on the show. It has been such a pleasure to speak with her. A special thank you to founder and executive producer, Martika Ibarra co-founder, costume designer, the legendary Marilyn Vance, and of course, John Campia from The John Campia Show. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tune in to the audio version wherever you listen to podcasts. I am, of course, your host, Robert Meyer Burnett, and you can find me on Instagram at rmburnett or find me on Twitter at burnettrm or on YouTube at Post Geek Singularity. Thanks very much. Like, subscribe, and give us your comments. What would you like to see on the channel? Right down below. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode of Designing Hollywood.